Ms. Margaret Brennan, CBS News State Department correspondent, is our next recipient. The citation will be read by Dr. John Stranges, university professor. Ms. Brennan, please come forward to center stage to join Father Marr. There is no harm in an occasional dream that the world's problems would disappear. But as Margaret Brennan has shown so often, foreign policy can never be reduced to a mere distraction from the more important matters at home. A native of Stanford, Connecticut, Ms. Brennan attended Catholic schools in nearby Greenwich. Before enrolling at the University of Virginia, where she earned a bachelor's degree in foreign affairs and Middle Eastern studies in 2002 with the highest distinction. A semester in Jordan as a Fulbright scholar following graduation enabled her to achieve fluency in the Arabic language. On completing her Fulbright studies, Ms. Brennan gave herself five years to become a broadcast journalist. Within two years, she was in front of the camera and by age 26 had landed her first on-air contract. Since that time, she, had, she has covered such major breaking news stories as the European debt crisis, the resignation of Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak live from Tahrir Square, and most recently, U.S. nuclear treaty negotiations with Iran. Today, Ms. Brennan is a CBS News correspondent assigned primarily to report on the diplomatic initiatives of the United States Department of State. She has traveled worldwide with State Secretaries John Kerry and Hillary Clinton, and on occasion with former Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel. She also reports independently from some of the world's most troubled areas, particularly the Middle East. And she is one of the few American correspondents to have reported directly from Tehran. Ms. Brennan's career began at CNBC, where she worked as a researcher, then a producer for Louis Rukeyser's Wall Street and Ron and Santa's Street Signs. She promptly landed interviews with President George W. Bush and Secretary of State Colin Powell and began contributing to NBC's Today Show and the Nightly News. In 2009, Ms. Brennan moved to Bloomberg Television to anchor In Business with Margaret Brennan, a weekday program broadcast from the New York Stock Exchange that covered global financial markets. Ms. Brennan joined, joined CBS News in 2012, where, in addition to her duties at the State Department, she serves as a substitute anchor on the network's This Morning Show and appears frequently as a foreign policy specialist on Bob Schieffer's Face the Nation. Still in her 30s, Ms. Brennan has already established herself as one of the best in a new generation of television journalists. Her ideas have weight and force, the product of a critically engaged student of international affairs. Ms. Brennan is a term member at the Council on Foreign Relations, a Whitehead Fellow with the Foreign Policy Association a member of the Economic Club of New York, and a member of the advisory board of the Smurfit School of Business at University College Dublin. In 2010, the Fulbright Association honored her with an award for international understanding. Niagara University congratulates Ms. Brennan on her marriage to Major Ali Iyad Yacoub last month. And today, it is with much pleasure that we, re re we recognize her remarkable professional character as a broadcast journalist by bestowing on her honoris causa the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters. Thank you, Dr. Stranges, and congratulations, Ms. Brennan. 
It is now my pleasure to call on Ms. Brennan, who will deliver the commencement address. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, uh, here at Niagara. It is wonderful to be here, and congratulations uh, to making it this far, all of you graduates. Um, it's kind of funny to be here because I grew up hearing about Niagara in large part because um, my father went here for his first year of college. Uh, he transferred about a year later to Manhattan College for reasons that I think had to do with enjoying himself a little bit too much while he was here at Niagara. <laughs> so given, <laughs> given that it was 1969, I can only imagine what that means, and I have never ever asked for details, which is kind of unusual for me because of what I do for a living, not to ask any follow-up questions. Um, but I think there are some things that are better left unsaid when it comes to your parents. So uh, now that I've embarrassed my dad and my mom and uh, induced a sense of Catholic guilt, I've done my job. <laughs> and uh, it turns out we will have, you know, a bit of Niagara on the wall, so to speak, <laughs> thanks to, to all of you. Um, so I was a little bit nervous about what I would say here today at uh, what is arguably one of the biggest transitions of your adult life. I thought long and I thought hard about what I could say and what was said to me when I was 22 and seated in your seats graduating from the University of Virginia uh, 13 years ago. And then it hit me. Um, I have absolutely no recollection whatsoever what my commencement speaker said. <laughs> Absolutely none. So there is a very good chance you won't remember anything that I say to you today. Um, but your parents likely will. Uh, they worked really long and they worked really hard for all of you to get here. And your heads are full because their pockets are empty. So please <laughs> make sure you turn and you thank them for everything that they have done to get you to this point. And also take a moment to really be thankful that you have been in a community for the past few years in which integrity, compassion, spirituality are really celebrated as core values. Because you might be searching for some of those things as you develop a life and a career outside of these gates. Before coming up here, I did a little bit of investigating about all of you, or at least what some of you admitted to the pollsters at Pew Research. According to them, your generation is known as the millennials. You're unattached to religion. You are burdened by debt. You're having a heck of a time finding a job. And you are in no rush to get married. All pretty heavy stuff. So I skipped ahead to more of the colorful items. Nearly four in 10 of you have a tattoo. And parents, you might want to cover your ears for this, one in four of you have a piercing in some place other than an earlobe. <laughs> but here's what I liked in reading this research. You were very optimistic about the future, and you were on course to be the most educated generation in American history. Do not lose those qualities. Exactly. So stay motivated, keep asking questions, and expand your horizons. Uh, here's who I am. I, you heard a bit about my resume, but these days I am a correspondent for CBS News, and I report on foreign policy for the network, which basically means that I spend a lot of time on airplanes chasing around decision makers and asking questions for a living. As a colleague of mine says, journalists have the responsibility of writing the first draft of history. So this week, that meant reporting from Camp David as President Obama tried to reassure Arab Gulf leaders about the upcoming nuclear deal with Iran, their longtime adversary, and tried to convince them that this will actually make the already volatile Middle East less dangerous. Yesterday, it meant spending an hour with a doctor from Chicago who had, own, had risked his own life at least dozens of times in the brutal battleground that is Syria in order to smuggle out evidence of continued chemical attacks being carried out by the Assad regime against civilians. 
He refuses to believe that Americans and the world could be numb to crimes so horrific that they should shock our collective conscience every day. And sometimes my job simply means trying to craft the right question, because at certain times, the inquiry itself can be a powerful force. And when you leave here, you won't get points for class participation and raising your hand, but you need to continue to do so. Ask questions. At 35 years old, I am far from old and wise, maybe a little bit old, but I can say that I love what I do and I consider myself very privileged. So I tried to put together a list of some of the things that I've learned along the way in the hope that you might find them useful. It's top 10, so we'll get through these, okay? 10, travel. Do it as often as you can and go as far as you can. Americans mainly travel with their television sets, not with their passports. Statistically, that is a fact. Please make it false. You are young. You will go to Europe when you're old and you're rich and you're able to afford the nice hotel and the really great wine. And don't let the Rainbow Bridge be the last border you cross uh, going to get a drink in Canada, okay? Make sure that you go to Africa, go to the Middle East, go to Asia parts of the world that take a little bit more out of you and get you outside your comfort zone. It's an education and you need to do it and you'll really appreciate it. But just be careful because I don't want to end up having to report on you. <laughs> Learn a language while you're at it, by the way. It's great perspective to be able to understand. In most places you land, people can break out English and speak to you. Nine. Treat the first four years of your next job as grad school. Be curious, because the chances are that at age 22, you don't have your dream job. You might not be paid well, because I certainly know that I was not. But that doesn't mean that beginnings don't matter. In fact, this is just the starting line. No matter what entry job you take, learn every skill set that you can. My first paid job in television uh, was as an entry-level research assistant for a financial news network. And I can tell you, I did not know the first thing about markets. But I treated it like paid journalism school. I also called my dad a lot. I learned. The employment landscape, certainly the media industry, is changing. Experience is often more important than the next degree. Eight. Say yes at work. Don't be the employee that tells your boss why it can't be done or why it's difficult. Just figure out how to do it. Ask questions, outwork the competition, take the extra assignment, the shift, and the extra hours. Don't take yourself out of the game. But one big caveat to this is you need to make sure it is a labor of love. Otherwise, you won't have a career. You'll just have a job. Seven, write the five-year plan and then throw it out the window. There are a few things more frustrating during a job interview than the inevitable question, so where do you want to be in five years? Because apart from working as hard as you can, it is really almost impossible to predict what will happen in the next five to 10. The best bet is to aim where you want to go and then figure out how to get there. Don't let your ambition blind you to the opportunities that surround you, surround you every day. Six, there are things that you cannot afford to ignore. Here are two of them. The economy. I can't tell you how many revolutions started because of kitchen table economics, or how many marriages dissolved because someone couldn't balance the checkbook. After a decade of covering financial news on Wall Street, I have to tell you I learned and take, to me, take with me to this job the knowledge that there is a financial angle to virtually every big social, cultural, educational, and political change. So know what you're facing. Don't throw away the business section of the newspaper. And while you're at it, make sure you read the international section too. That's my second priority for you. 
Keep a very close eye on what your country is doing outside of what can be our sometimes very insulating borders. As Thomas Jefferson said, information is the currency of democracy. You need to continue to accumulate it. Five, relationships matter. In fact, connecting with people is among the very few things that really do. Your personal involvement with others will make the difference between getting the first interview and the job, or whether your coworkers go the extra mile for you, or they choose not to. Your social and professional networks are among your most valuable assets, so don't underestimate that. And you never know who or what the intern sitting next to you today might be in the future. You probably will see them again. But even more important, the best friends that you have made here and will make in the next few years will become your shield, provide you support, and show you the way forward. They will become your family. They will keep you sane, which leads me to my next thought. Four, mental health is as important as physical. We spend so much time, effort, and money trying to perfect and sculpt our physical selves. You must be as vigilant in preserving your mental and emotional well-being. Where your mind is, your body will follow. Vent to your friends, talk to your family, share your experiences, and ask for help and make sure you offer it when you notice a friend in distress. I can't tell you how many times this has hit home for me. I thought of it when I was covering the Newtown school shootings in my native Connecticut, where one man's untreated mental illness had fatal consequences for total innocence. And now on a near weekly basis, we're reminded when we hear that some of the most vulnerable are being recruited by radical groups. There are other contributing factors. You know that. All of us could write a paper on it. But you can't ignore what's at the root here. And I mention these very extreme examples because they offer some perspective. You need to take momentary mental health checks and don't ignore anxiety, trauma, and emotional duress. The next few years are going to be stressful. So worry less about making the right move and more about being in the right mind. Three, you have five senses and logic is not one of them. Don't beat yourself up for loving the wrong person, studying the wrong topic, which you might have done, or taking some career missteps. There is literally no way to avoid it. Love, passion, and emotion are just not rational, but it is dealing with the recovery that makes you a better person. And keeping those relationships with the friends that I mentioned to you is going to get you through it. Two. Save a life. Adopt a dog. Adopt a cat, too. That's fine. I'm a dog person. <laughs> Volunteer at a shelter or simply give to a conservation effort. One of the greatest decisions I've ever made is to adopt a little dog named Yogi. These furry little beings can unconditionally love, and there is so much to be learned from that. And number one, expect the unexpected. Take a look at the graduate to your left and to your right. If I'm any example, you might be married to one of them in 17 years. <laughs> Seriously, that just happened to me. <laughs> last month. <laughs> I got married last month to a wonderful man and fellow Virginia grad who I'm sure has a bright red face right now in the front row. Um, and I first met him when I was a freshman in college. Uh, we call them first years down at UVA. Both of us say we would never have dated the other one back then. Well, it turns out that 17 years later, he and I aren't such different people after all. Maybe we just had to live enough life on our own to see who the real person is standing across from us. And I tell you this story because as you move through your 20s and pass through the gates of this university, these times, these people, and these experiences will play a large role in who you become and will continue to shape you in ways that you cannot even imagine. So keep your eyes, your minds, and your hearts open. And congratulations, good luck to you, class of 2015.